Um, I'd like to start just by making some general points about the street, and then I'll go on and very, very briefly refer to some of the research that I've been doing on the way, um, just to sort of set the tone for the day. Um, so, obviously, I see streets as hybrids of human and non-human association and connection. This is where a kind of composite ecology of human and non-human interactions and socialities take place. I think it's important in all that to see the private and the public as not distinct. And it's very much kind of where those intersections between private and public take place that you get these sort of indeterminate spaces of in-betweenness, which are, I think, intriguing and, and worth investigating. So the street is about humans, it's about bodies, it's about smells, it's about sounds, it's about symbols, it's about technologies and objects, all sort of rubbing along together, bumping into each other in all sorts of multiple ways, creating multiple uh, socialities and interactions. And, and these are, I think, endlessly reworked. All of these intersect in the street, which itself is a kind of gathering space, a gathering point, if you like, of difference. But it's important, I think, to argue that it's not just a gathering point of difference as constituted. The street itself constitutes difference. In other words, it makes up differences. They're constantly in play and not given. In this sense, then, the street is a kind of adaptive assemblage. <coughs> it brings people together and brings socialities into being. In that context, the street is changing. The atmospheres of the street are always changing. I think it's a very kind of historically contingent space. So also, I would suggest that what matters in the street isn't always visible, that there's a kind of complicated interplay between the street as, as spaces of, of visibility, but also of invisibility. And some of those kind of invisibilities um, are worth investigation. And I'll kind of come back to that. These different sites and spaces in the city and objects mean different things to different people. And again, I think this is a really kind of important kind of underlying point for research and thinking about the, the street, that it's not something that has any kind of, you, you can't fix its meaning. It's one that is shifting, it's changing, and it's contingent, and it means different things to different people. So again, I think in terms of doing research, um, it's important that, that we we think about that. So some general point, uh, it's a space of becoming. It's not given, but it's made by the bodies that are in there and it intersections with objects. Um, it's uh, constituted through shifting senses and atmospheres, historically contingent. This, I'm sure those of you would just can think of any street you know, how particular times and particular places, um, how much it changes. And I mean, we, obviously, gentrification is a very good example of that, how, how streets are changing very, very fast in many places. It's a symbolic space of contestation. I'll come back to that. So the meaning of the street can often be something that's contested because, it mean, because it's symbolic. The way we understand it symbolically might be different depending on who we are. In that sense, it's an ambivalent space. It's not a space that's fixed. And I think... It's interesting to think about the street as a space of objects and socio-material connections. So those are just some kind of general points to, to uh, set it up and think about the street. Um, now I'm just going to talk a bit more specifically about um, bodies. One of the, I think, uh, interesting things about the street is to think of it as a space of bodies, entangled space of bodies, uh, bodies and things, bodies and urban infrastructures, and the pleasures and aesthetics. And we'll be coming back to some of that. There's been uh, a great deal more interest in bodies and materiality in the last 10 years, or five years particularly, which has changed the way we think about the street from thinking about sort of sociality as somehow kind of, in a way, almost separate from bodies to one where bodies are very much kind of right there, right there in what we think about. I'm interested in the way in which um, embodied spaces of the street, um, it's through that that the global, if you like, is integrated into the spaces of everyday life, where attachment, emotions, and morality come in to play. So um, I'd suggest that embodied spaces of the streets are sites of translocal and transnational space as well as personal experience and perception. And I mean, the markets, which I've worked on and, and Dawn has worked on too, is, is very much kind of a space where those things make sense, I think. And, and Susie will be talking about that more later, I suspect. So markets particularly, I, I would argue, um, embodied spaces which assemble and enact the transnational connections through the sounds and smells of the market, through different foods and commodities, through different kinds of music and so on. And there's been increasing amount of work done on that. The intimacies of body movements, 
um, uh, that take place there. Now, I think it's really important when we talk about bodies and think about bodies is to think about how these are determined by both class and ethnic dispositions and bodily deportments. So in, in some senses, the way in which bodies go into the street are already pre-orientating the possibilities of encounter in public. They're not, they're not unclassed, ungendered, unsexed, unracialized. And these self-same encounters, in a sense, constitute and renew certain kinds of possibilities and dispositions. So if you like, um, what I'm trying to say here is the presentation of bodies involving body type clothes, style of movement, gait, and so on, express very much about relations of power, class and power. Who's enabled to be there, who can be in the street, is not one that's separate from questions of power and questions of, of other kinds of uh, uh, divisions in society. So how bodies present in public is important in how people come in to co-present publics of the street and react to others. I think so much is communicated, if you like, before a word is even spoken. And this has consequences for thinking about the multiple publics in the street. These are just some pictures I like um, of bodies in the street, but how people... We learn so much about the way people work, walk and hold themselves in the street. So another kind of... Um, issue that I'd like to bring into play here is the element of affect. Now, this is decidedly, of course, non-rational, but yet it's very important for the consideration of urban publics. The, you know, sounds can register mood and affect, and aesthetic and symbolic feels. Sensory resonances combined with material and technological organization of the street to create atmospheres. And I mean, this is, this is sort of, I put this up because I think it's sort of affectless, virtually. I mean, it's sort of draining of affect space. And, you know, you know immediately when you get into spaces like this that you sort of feel totally depressed, you know, sort of, ugh, but they're overplanned and so on. Again, I mean, this is, this is just, you know, just pictures that kind of interest me. Interesting in a way about bodies here, because there are no bodies. As soon as you have bodies, I took quite a lot of pictures of this particular space in Vienna, and as soon as people start using this for um, skateboarding, it, becomes, it fills itself up with a completely different feel. So it's sort of, you know, this is what I mean about changing space and changing time. Uh, that's just, um, just a picture I like in the street in, in Kingston. Okay. So in, in the street, there are swirls of multiplicity, rhythms, regulation of surprise, aesthetics of space, and all these temper the public feelings by working on our senses in different ways, often in silent ways. So we need a different kind of approach to think about what are the grounds for conviviality, what are the grounds for, for different kinds of publics, what are the limitations to human recognition in city streets. We need to attend to the resonances and multiplicities and compromises and compliances that are taking place, the way in which these tendencies are are very surprising and often ominous. And it means to me that we need to look at different kinds of things. We need to be watchful to a plurality of, uh, of those things that are taking places in the street. Human affinities that are formed in public space happen in very different ways. The plurality and vitality of streets happen in very different ways. The ways in which we're gathered together in the street. These are the kinds of things that we need to think about. So I'm just going to sort of talk about I've got 10 more minutes. I'm just going to talk about some of these things in slightly more detail. Um, I th this question of um, the symbolic boundaries is very important. I, I did some work quite a long time ago, and I revisited it because we were doing an OU course on boundaries. And in fact, this is a um, boundary called the Erev that some of you might know, and it's a, it's a wire in the street um, that separates out. I don't know how many people of you know about this, but I'll just sort of say a couple of words because it's quite an interesting example of symbolic space in the street. But this wire defines an area for the purposes of Sabbath, um, making it possible that people can go into what is normally designated as public space. It becomes designated as private space by the putting of a boundary around the area, which is this wire. It's a kind of complicated um, religiously... Um, defined space. The point about this is that it kind of divides private from public and secular from sacred and Sabbath from every day in the street in complicated ways. And this is a wire that, in fact, if you actually go and look for it, if you know where these are, there's one in Barnet in North London, it's very hard. This is the wire here. 
it's very hard to see it. The point there that I think is really fascinating, and I did a sort of study of it 10 years ago, but I went back and, and interviewed people now about it to see how it has sort of bedded down, is that it's had an enormous impact. Now, it's had an impact because it has meaning. It matters to some people, and it doesn't matter to others. To those that it matters, it means that women can go out in the street with their kids and push their children around on Saturday. They couldn't do that before. It means people in wheelchairs can take their wheelchairs. It means old people can take sticks, all of which were not possible before the bit of the wire. Now, what means something quite different to people who, don't, who feel opposed to it. I interviewed uh, quite a lot of um, non uh, religious Jewish people in the community are very hostile to this thing because they feel like, why should we be defined in this space that gets reconstituted as a Jewish space by this war? Point here, therefore, is that the symbolic meaning of spaces um, and streets is often very difficult to read from just initially uh, one's entry into a street. So as researchers and urban sociologists, it's important <coughs> that we kind of get beneath the, um, the obvious meaning of place. I've done quite a lot of work on symbolic questions of space, and we might want to come back to them. Um, another kind of interest I have is about affect and ambivalence. And um, with Onamik Sahar, who's at Goldsmiths, we did some work on the um, streets in Redbridge. And uh, these are the streets that you see in a lot of parts of, of London, um, outer London suburbs. This is Redbridge, but there's quite a lot of houses that look like this, I think, in, in South London as well. And um, the point about this area is it's an area where uh, South Asian people moved. Onamik, who I did the research with himself, is from this community, which made it much easier to do the research than if it had just been me. But um, the, the, the kinds of things that people have done to the street um, are like this. So you have um, gold railing tipped, 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 tipped fences. You have uh, paid, paved over yards at the front of the house, cars, and so on. Now, these are very, very kind of classic ways in which houses have been changed by this community. We did some work um, interviewing, and it was really, really interesting, because what we found was a very kind of ambivalent response to this kind of architectural change. And this wasn't um, of us, to us of interest to look at what the white response to it was. That would be all sorts of things that perhaps would be quite predictable. We were interested in how the um, South Asian communities themselves related to this. What we found was, and we were interviewing people of Onomix generation, which was the second generation South Asians, that they were actually very, very ambivalent about the kinds of changes that their parents and their communities had made to the kind of facades of the street. And what they said was that they felt some kind of nostalgia and kind of melancholic, uh, using kind of Gilroy's idea, sort of melancholia, about the changing in the neighborhood. From them, their point of view had been growing up in this area, there'd been orchards, there'd been trees, and so on and so forth. They liked that. It felt to them like their home. And they were kind of, why do we have to have these kinds of changes take place in our neighborhood? So we described this in terms of a sort of ambivalence of what Stuart Hall called the multicultural drift. And we found that this particular generation, what was striking about our interviews with them was that their, their sense of the street was one of lament, one of nostalgia, one of sort of sadness about how the street was no longer how they remembered it as children. So again, I think it's kind of interesting here because the point is that the different generations had a very different take on what this architecture, what this architecture of the street meant to them. For the older generation, it gave them a sense of, of pride that they had uh, the possibility of displaying their cars, feeling um, able to, you know, to decorate their houses in a certain kind of way. That's a bit of a whistle-stop tour through quite a long um, piece of work that we did. But um, if people are interested, certainly do take it up. Another kind of piece of work that, um, that I've been involved with is this um, work on mundane objects in public space. And here we were thinking that um, very often the kind of small objects of the street are kind of overlooked. They're not thought about as important. But we became interested in how do these objects constitute possibilities and spaces of the street? And we've argued here that going after things as they circulate, combine, disconnect, and traverse multiple physical, institutional, public, and personal spaces actually reveals a complex gravitational field of networks of people, artifacts, and socio-material practices. And that these are very fragile. The stability and order and, uh, if you like, territoriality of the street is something that's that's very fragile and that it has to be studied in its concreteness and everydayness. So we went, um, we proposed 
to look at um, these kinds of objects. So uh, toilets, uh, bike racks, bollards. One of my colleagues was very keen on bollards. She took so many pictures of them. Um, waste bins, and so on. And the idea in that project was to sort of try and actually argue that the objects in the street make differences of all kinds. So in other words, if you were to take something, and this is Harvey Mollich's work, you might have read his, his uh, book on the, on the public toilet, but what's interesting about the public toilet is it brings together groups in unexpected ways. And this is this notion that interests and groups are not constructed in the street. They're not pre-given, sorry. They don't come into the street necessarily. We don't come into the street as pre-given groups of people. We are made if you like, by the street. And in the case of the, the toilet, what he set out to show was that people using wheelchairs, for example, had as much in common, their interests were in common, with uh, women p pushing push chairs with their babies. In other words, that group shared the same sense of exclusion from the space as it was constructed. And you can start to think about the way in which objects actually make different interests, and that these objects cause us to move in certain kinds of ways. We often don't think about them, but I mean, the bollard is the classic one. You know, the bollards were originally put, a lot of the bollards that in London were put up as a kind of anti-IRA um, coming into the city and around the kind of period of the, the, the IRA um, bombs and so on. But they've, they've, they've been re reconstituted, and now there's these clear, clearing uh, groups, campaigns trying to de declutter the street. There's all these decluttering campaigns. So objects are not, mundane objects are not irrelevant to the way in which we occupy space. They actually are worth, as it were, taking care of. So, I mean, taking, uh, paying attention to them. Finally, um, I've been thinking about large, um, I've been thinking not just about objects in terms of um, little objects, but in terms of uh, the materiality of, um, of structures, uh, infrastructures. And one of these... Um, infrastructures that I've been thinking about is, is Brixton Market. Now, Brixton Market, as many of you would know, is a very, very diverse and multicultural space that brings so many different people together. Historically, has been really important for um, a space of, of belonging, becoming, settling, um, and, and, and for different migrant groups over really a very long time, and has been remarkable in, in that way. It, you know, it coalesces, if you like, the kinds of things I was talking about, the multiplicity of bodies, objects, aesthetics, sounds, um, matter. People gather together. I mean, this is true of all markets, and it's particularly true of some markets. And I'd say Brixton Market was a case in point, that it gathers people together in all sorts of unpredictable ways. And these are people from across the globe, historically, uh, living alongside people who were quite often low-income, um, white, and so on. In, in, recent, uh, in recent years, this has been under threat. And I became really kind of interested in um, seeing uh, Brixton from this kind of socio-material assemblage kind of point of view and thinking about those multiplicity of publics and thinking about what was going on with the materiality of this space. And um, for me, in a Latourian sense, it became a matter of concern. And it became a matter of concern because I, as I went back to see it, I don't live in South London, I live in North London, you know, never cross the river. Um, <laughs> in the early days, I used to cross the river quite a lot because I had lots of friends there, and it used to be as I describe. I suddenly was becoming aware that this was a space that was under threat. It seemed to me it was under threat, quite literally, uh, from the kinds of changing uh, materiality of the area. And this was through gentrification. And to cut a sort of fairly long story short, this gentrification set of processes has led to uh, this becoming a very, uh, is in the process of leading this to become a very different kind of market. Um, what's exciting about this space is it's, it's, it fits what I was saying before about the private and public. It's a sort of liminal space. Lots of the streets are, the shops go straight onto the street. There's not a shop front, there's just a open, you can see this is a shop that is a street, uh, that is also a street stall. These here are, you know, these are spaces which where the, there's a sort of seamless line between the street and the shops. And, it's a, and, and it makes for these kind of liminal spaces make for all sorts of, I think, interesting sort of socialities and interconnections. Um, what's happening now is that the, these arches are under threat because National Rail are about to um, redevelop them. And uh, most of the people who are, have had these places for a very long time can no longer afford 
or imagining that once the gentrification process takes place and these are revamped and restructured, they won't be able to stay there. Um, I like this because it's a sort of body metaphor, if you like, as well, ripping the heart out of the community. So here is a, a very interesting case study of um, a sort of shifting infrastructural material base where the old undercovered market has been revamped by a company who bought it up and has turned it into a very nice place for people to go and have um, you know, wine and cheese and champagne and so on. Um, and it's a place which a, a lot of the original inhabitants uh, can't live in, so can't afford to go and um, entertain themselves. In, um, one of the, the kind of things I followed here was this. And this is kind of going back to methods, I guess, which you raised, Phil. This object here, um, this is a bulk, these are bulk objects. One of the reasons that Brixton was very important to the people who used to come there, or have come there for years and years and years, is because you can buy very large uh, sacks of rice and very large cans of oil and very large things. Um, the way in which people used to do that was that they came into the market to uh, shop by parking in a shopping um, old, you know, one of those old uh, concrete car parks. Again, this is a very long story. I'm trying to make it short because I've only got two more minutes. But what happened was they decided to revamp the car park. This is a history of Tesco putting a supermarket in Streatham and so on and so forth, closed the car park. Now, the council didn't really think much about closing the car park. But the interesting point about this is, it's the, and this is a sort of point about materiality and structures and governance and all sorts of questions coming together. When I interviewed the local people about it, the thing that they felt most strongly about were these bulk goods because they said a lot of them would go into those car parks, park their car, get lots of this stuff, and off they would go. Now, with no car park, they can't, these are big, heavy things, especially women with, you know, perhaps kids and so on and so forth. It's very difficult to buy these objects anymore because there's no way to cart them home. My point here really is that, you know, if you follow something like an object like this and you follow through how it connects into, in this case, the parking station, the people who use the car, the people who use the car park, the people who use the market, and how one small change, and in fact in Brixton there's lots of small changes. I mean, I, I pointed to the, to the getting rid of the, its arches. Um, there's the, 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 the change in the undercover market towards, uh, as I said, a kind of gentrified space. What these material changes are doing is changing the, the kind of publics who can now be in that street space, that street market. So a bunch of things often unexpected, unpredictable. I don't think anybody particularly thought that bringing down the car park, ending the car park, I'm finishing, was going to change the whole way in which that market felt for the people who were using it. So, that's really uh, just kind of a quick whiz through um, thinking about a space from that perspective. So I think I'll end there. I mean, I've thrown a lot of things open to, 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 to hopefully create some sense of the street as a very complex and ambivalent and difficult space to just take for granted. Thank you very much.